I believe that your past does not define you. It is how you overcome that does. Uh, I did not have a very good childhood in my younger years. I lived in a two-bedroom apartment with my mother, my brothers James, Daryl, and Daniel, and my older sister Tara. My dad was not present in the household often because him and my mom weren't married and they would have fallings out where he would leave for days at a time. He was also a truck driver, which took him away as well. When he was in the household, he would do his best to take care of us, but it was very infrequent that we saw him. My mom struggled with a substance abuse problem due to the fact that she had a condition called scoliosis. This is basically a curvature of the back that is very painful. It started out with her um, using prescription pills to alleviate the pain but it escalated out of control where she was using any sort of drugs that she can get her hands on and then washing them down with alcohol. Before this all happened, she was a fairly good mother, but the substance abuse turned her into a monster, basically. She would um, go into fits of rage and she would beat my siblings and I. My brother Daryl and I got the brunt of it since we were the middle siblings. My sister Tara and my brother James didn't get it as badly because they were old enough to either run away or to defend themselves. My brother Daniel was just a baby at the time and he was neglected more than abused. She wouldn't change his diapers. She would put him in a room by himself with toys and forget about him. My brother Daryl and I would run away from the household in order to get away from her and she would send my siblings after us to build animosity between us. Uh, we would run to a friend's house, go hide out in the playground, or I can recall one time we even hid in a furniture store. And when we would be brought back to our house, my mom would beat us either with closed or open fists with a leather belt on our bare skin or her personal favorite was pick a switch. This is when we would have to go out into the yard and pick a branch from a tree and bring it back to her. If it was too thick, we would be sent back out to get a thinner branch because the thinner it was, the worse it hurt. I can remember being locked in a closet because I was disobedient. This was a closet where the light, was, the light switch was on the outside. I was in that closet for about 10 hours, although it felt like days. This has given me a sort of fear for closed, and closed spaces and also a fear of the dark. Um, I can manage those, but I haven't completely gotten over them. One summer when we were playing on the playground, uh, my brother Daryl's toy fell underneath a swing set. He crawled under the swing to get it while a little boy was swinging. The little boy kicked my brother in the head and he passed out. James picked up Daryl and took him home and laid him on the couch and then went to go get my mother. My mother didn't take Daryl to the hospital because she was afraid of being deemed a neglectful parent and also she didn't have insurance. My brother laid in his feces and vomit for days. We tried to clean him up the best we could, but we were little and didn't really understand what was going on. My dad eventually came back from one of his truck driving trips, and when he found out what happened, he went into a fit of rage. He screamed at my mom and told her that she was an abusive parent and that he never wanted to see her again. He then picked up my brother, put him in his truck, and took him to the hospital. My brother Daryl had to be airlifted to Loma Linda Children's Center that day because he was suffering from a subdural hematoma, which is a, is a bleeding in the brain. If Daryl would have gotten to Loma Linda Children's Center, even two hours later, he would have died. Um, this situation really hurt my siblings and I because this was our mom and she had done this to our brother. What kind of parent would do that?
the doctors called Child Protective Services and they took my siblings and I into foster care with the agency Alt Crest. My sister Tara and I were separated from our brothers and went to live with a couple named Vanessa and Jim. Vanessa and Jim were only foster parents due to the monetary gain and were very cruel to my sister and I. One time uh, I was eating dinner and I forgot to, um, to completely clean out my plate before I put it in the dishwasher. Vanessa dragged me by my hair over to where the plate was and screamed at me. Then she made me sit on the floor until everybody else was done eating. On January 25th, 2001, my father passed away of lung cancer. He had a tumor in his lungs and a tumor in his brain. We were not told until the day of my birthday at my first ever birthday party by my foster parents. The hardest thing about this whole situation was we were scheduled for a visit with my dad the following week. I will never be over the fact that I never got to tell my dad that I loved him one last time or to say goodbye. Shortly after this, my sister and I were moved into the foster home that my brothers were at with a, an elderly couple named Roy and Carrie Watson. It took quite a while for me to warm up to them and for about the first six months that we were living with them, I would not speak to anybody but my siblings and have them relay the information that I needed. <sighs> Eventually, Carrie got through to me because one day she was helping me clean my room and she had discovered that I was hoarding food under the bed. She sat me down and she said, Sarah, you never have to hoard food again. You can get food whenever you want in this household. Um, I was skeptical, so I tested that theory. I would get food in the middle of the night. I would get food when we're having family discussions. <clears throat> Just any sort of time to be obnoxious. Sometimes I would smack my mouth so loudly just to see if she was going to get angry with me. Finally, she said, Sarah, you can eat, but you need to be quiet about it. <laughs> uh, she said, I know you're trying to test my patience right now, but I still have patience with you. Just eat quieter. We're trying to talk. Um, Roy got through to me in a different way. He taught me how to ride a dirt bike and eventually gave me one of his older ones to use. I ended up crashing that bike, and I was sprawled on the floor like cuts and scrapes, and he immediately ran over to me to check if I was okay. I said, Roy, what about your bike? And he goes, whatever, I don't care about the bike, I can get a new bike, are you okay? And that just amazed me because every adult in my life up to this point of Roy and Carrie had either let me down or had died. And so for him to care more about me than this $2,000 bike was just shocking. I, I couldn't believe it. I thought it was a farce. Um, he took me in the house and cleaned up my scrapes and bruises. And then he joked about it to Carrie. And he was like, looks like we need to go get a new dirt bike. <laughs> um, this was when I really started to fall in love with Carrie and Roy as my parents, and I asked them to become mom and dad to me. They were extremely happy about this and were just so shocked at how far I had come from whenever I came to their house. They took us on trips, they took us on vacations, uh, to amusement parks, to theaters and plays, and really became our parents. And it just, it's so moving to me because here are these people that were strangers before now who took in my siblings and I, took care of us, treated us like their own kids when we had no blood relation to them. And this wasn't the first time that they had taken in foster kids. They have fostered over 60 children in their lifetime. They actually won an award for Southern California for Foster Parents of the Year in 2012. Roy and Carrie became my heroes. They became the people that I aspired to be like. They became the people that I wanted to make proud of me. When I was in high school, I decided to join the Air Force. 
I had gotten a partial scholarship to a college, but I was fearful of that going forward with that step in my life. So whenever I spoke to Roy and Carrie about it, they said, we think the Air Force would be a great area for you. It will provide you a roof over your head, it will provide you discipline, and you can still go to school while you're in the Air Force. They drove me 45 minutes in one direction to see the recruiter, and once I was accepted into the debt program, drove me back every week for a year. One of my proudest moments is when I was swearing into the Air Force and knowing that my mom and dad were on the sidelines smiling at me and cheering for me. They wrote me letters every single week in basic, and I lived for those letters. When it came time to tap me out of formation at graduation, there were tears streaming down all of our faces. I was so proud in that moment to know that my mom and dad were there supporting me. Bad things happen. Bad things happen to good people. But you can decide to dwell on those bad things and live in the past, or you can decide to overcome and fight for a better future. My mom is now sober, and she has her GD and is living a good life. I've decided to forgive her, and we have a good relationship now. If I had decided to dwell in the past and to not allow that relationship to blossom again, I wouldn't know the person she is today, and I absolutely love the person she is today. The past does not define me. I define myself. I am a daughter, I am a wife to my wonderful husband, Blake. I am a friend, and most of all, I am a survivor. Without Roy and Carrie Watson, I would not be up here today telling you this story. Anybody can be an advocate for a foster child. You don't have to be a foster parent as long as you are just supporting them. So to anybody who has ever fostered a child, been a support for a foster child, or even been a foster child's friend, thank you. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. Morning, everybody. I just to say my story is about three and a half hours long, plus bloopers and gag reel and all that stuff. So let's see if I can actually just give you a trailer instead. From the top of the world, one man would lose it all, only to find himself. Sergeant Roberts is in. Welcome to the best slash worst year of your life. So in 2011, I was uh, stationed at Thule Air Base, Greenland. And I, I chose to be there. And it would be a one year assignment. And to give you kind of like a, an understanding of that environment, you're on an island. The closest town to you is 150 miles through snow and death. So you're not gonna make it there. So whatever you brought with you is what you got, and whatever you can get shipped to you is what you'll have. And it's quiet, it's bright, it's dark. Um, the best way to explain how the light cycle works is that um, just extend a day through an entire year, and that's pretty much how that works out. And uh, the stars at night, I've never, uh, you basically see them all. And during the, uh, the summertime is when the sun's always up, that kind of deal. And I don't think I'm really, okay, stop, stop, stop. So <laughs> here's an easier way to say it. You don't get your phone, it doesn't work. <laughs> That's the level of depravity that you have, all right? Just so you understand. Uh, so <clears throat> things usually happen in threes. And I'm already a couple months into my assignment. And uh, the first phone call, which is how we usually get bad news, right? So the first phone call is that my grandmother-in-law has passed away. My, uh, she was a very nice lady. Uh, I had a, a fantastic time to uh, actually see her before I went on this assignment. Uh, the second phone call would be about a week later. And that was when uh, my wife had emergency surgery. And the good thing was that she was there for the, the funeral, so uh, she's already with family, she's taking straight to the hospital, uh, and knows she's there. And it's kind of one of those things like, oh, hey, on the phone call, it's just like, hey, uh, 
just so you know, I had emergency surgery, and you're like, whoa, 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 like, what's going on? Uh, of course, you always want to uh, be discussing this stuff with your leadership and get your uh, supervisor involved, and just so that they know what, what's going on with you. And uh, so I was working shifts there, so it's like 12-hour days, nights, that kind of deal. And I had just finished a rotation of mid -shift. so I'm waking up around like 10, 11 o'clock at night, and the phone does a double ring, which means it's, uh, it's a phone call coming in from uh, Off Island. So you want to pick that up. It's not your boss saying, oh, hey, you got to come in for, for work tomorrow. And so I, I pick it up, and right away, it's, uh, it's my wife asking, um, when was the last time we had an HIV test? And I'm thinking, oh, well, we are out processing December time frame, so December, November time frame, uh, and it's already like May. And I'm like, no, that's like the, the benefit of being in a monogamous relationship. You don't have to worry about this kind of fact. And she's like, well, uh, and that's when like, the air gets sucked out of me. And you start to realize what is going on. And I just remember just looking at the base of the earth. And it's, it's burning to my, into my eyes now. I can tell you every speck of dirt on that thing where the crease was, where they, they did a bad paint job. And I'm like, no, 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 no. This, this can't be happening to me. Like, not here, not now. And it's really about being pushed to your limit. And if there was like a list of bad things that can happen to me, at the time, this is number one. And uh, the, the rest of the conversation is, yelling and screaming and all this other stuff and uh, at some point I just kind of hang up and I'm like okay wait wait I got up I got a couple days off and go you know get ready check some emails get some work done you know that kind of deal jump in the shower and I can't even feel the temperature because when it started it was like a, a match that in the middle of it and I don't know if it was a hot shower, I can tell you if it's a cold shower, but I just started doing a rewind for the conversation. And I rewound all the way back to the front. And so I jump out of the shower, call my wife right up again, and I'm like, okay, wait, 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 do I have HIV? And she's like, no, 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 you shouldn't have it. But then, like, how can you believe that, right? How can I believe anything that she's going to And so I'm like, all right, whatever, click. Jump on the computer, I'm going to get on some emails and all that kind of stuff. It's taking way too long. Before I know it, I'm Googling, like, how do I go through a divorce in Colorado? Like, how do I get a lawyer? All this you know, horrible stuff. And it's already midnight or past midnight by this point, and nobody's up. It's in the middle of the week. And now I'm just pacing, like, up and down the halls, just trying to stay busy. And I'm like, what is going on? What is going on? And I finally get back to my seat in my, in my room. And I'm just sitting there, I'm like, I'm losing it. I'm losing it. And then I got a epiphany. It's a very clear idea, and you know when, you, when it happens to you. Wait, I'm not the only one to go through this. I'm not the first person to go through what I, <laughs> this situation. And so I'm like, wait, hold on a second. So the whole time that I was like walking down the halls, up and down, the answer was actually smiling right at me. And it was a picture of the chaplain in the middle of our day room. I'm like, come on, I can call just the chaplain. At least I can talk to somebody. I didn't want to like wake up my supervisor or anybody else in my chain. I knew I wasn't suicidal. I just needed to talk to somebody. And so I called him up. Uh, and by now it's like three in the morning and uh, he basically said, yeah, I'll be right over, that kind of stuff. And I remember opening up my windows and the doors and all that kind of stuff and I can still recall like the crackle of the tires like on top of the ice when it was coming apart at the dorms. And uh, for the next three hours, he just sat there and listened. And at the end of it, he's like, you know what, no, you got a plan. You got a plan. Looks like you uh, have a good head on your shoulders. Yeah. Um, 
We're good. We're good. We're going to have to get through this. But you're, you're going to be good. And he's right. So the first place you go, Megru. <laughs> Uh, Boba's taking all that kind of stuff, and of course, uh, being on the island, uh, you're going to have to wait an extra two weeks. So usually you get like four weeks for an HIV test to come back, and uh, so now it's six. Um, and just to give you a little bit of a fast forward here, uh, it came back negative, all that kind of stuff. It was all good. Um, and then the next was, uh, it was an email, and ironically, I remember that I deleted it. And it was for a counselor that was coming out to Ireland. Because I got the email days before all this mess started happening. And uh, my supervision basically asked, among other things, you know, like are you suicidal, but uh, would you mind uh, going to go see this counselor? And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. And the great part about that was uh, she basically said that you're going to have to go through, you know, the stages of the grief. And you're going to have to figure out, you know, but this is a loss. You're going to have to get through this. And so, denial is the first stage. We got, <laughs> ran right through that stage pretty fast. Um, and I went almost straight into anger. I was really, really mad. Uh, I chose this assignment for us. I was there for us. And this is what happened. And I was just mad. I was just mad. And when I talked to my commander, I just said, when I'm at work, I want to be at work. I'll focus on that. I can focus on the mission. That's easy. When I'm at home, I'll be taking care of this stuff. And my commander said, yes, that's fine. Um, and it worked out. It was pretty easy at that point. So some time passed. And uh, before I knew it, I'm like already halfway through my tour. And I'm getting through it. Uh, the best advice I ever got in my career was whenever you're going through stuff that you can't handle um, and it's going to be legal, get a lawyer. Get a lawyer. Uh, it saved me. It saved other people that I told this advice to. Get a lawyer. It makes it way easier. Um, I was going to be off island. I can't deal with paperwork from you know out of country. I had a lawyer. It was great. So. Uh, check results came out, and I made it. And then I got the email from AFPC that said, nope, I'm missing the EPR from the record. All right, this is just another thing on top of everything else. And I was already getting to the bargaining stage. And this is when you realize, okay, this is how it's going to be. Okay, it's going to be a fight. I get it. That's fine. And then, um, and then next was um, understanding that, uh, yeah, depression's going to be next. And I was really worried about that stage. And so uh, I was going to get ready for going to my mid-tour. This slide. And uh, I had orders to Germany, following orders. And this went back to a conversation that I had with my commander. He asked if I wanted to come back to the States and deal with the stuff. And I said, no, I don't want to screw up my phone in order. And uh, that's when I got the email right before going on my mid-tour to come back to the States to sign paperwork. And uh, they've been canceled. Okay, great. All right. I get it. I'm going through the ringer. I get it. And uh, at this point, um, yeah, I'm definitely understanding this is how it's going to be. And I'm like, it's fine. I don't, I don't care about it anymore. Now I just need to know where to send my goods. That's it. And, uh, and so next is going to be depression. And the best thing you can do uh, when you're stuck in a scenario, you're stuck in an environment that's probably not going to be helpful for you, get out of it. So I went on my mentor. Got off island. Came back to the States, signed divorce papers. And uh, just the craziest stuff was, was happening. Music started to mean something. Like all like the heartbreak songs and all that kind of stuff. Like <laughs> those songs were for me, you know? That's how I felt. It was perfect. And uh, so then it was time for me to, to get back, finish up my tour. 
And uh, so I kind of got through the, the depression stage and at the perfect time. And now is for me uh, to finish up. And uh, I came across this quote. It's actually from the Rocky Balboa movie. And when you hear something that's like perfect, you know it. And it was, and it goes like this: the world ain't all sunshine and rainbows. It's a very mean and nasty place. And I don't care how tough you are; it'll beat you down to your knees and keep you there permanently if you let it. You, me, or nobody is going to hit as hard as life. But it ain't about how hard you hit; it's about how hard you get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. Because that's how winning is done. Now, if you know what you're worth, you go out and get what you're worth. But you got to be willing to take the hits. And not pointing fingers, saying you ain't where you want to be because of him or her or anybody. Cowards do that, and that ain't you. I'm like, that's, once again, it was like the genius thing that just came to me. I was like, that's perfect. That's exactly where I'm at. It's like, so I was ready to leave. And this is like the perfect picture for it because uh, this is actually one of the last days of the year where the sun comes up on the horizon. So I'd get on a plane and I'd fly into the, not sunset, but the sunrise. And this is when like the movie would hit the credits, right? But that's not how life is, right? So the good part right, is that it's not over, right? You can move on. Yeah, it sucks. When you go through this stuff, it sucks and it hurts. It's painful. But you can get through it. I got through it, and I thought it was the worst thing possible. I thought I literally hit my limit, but I didn't. I started my, uh, my bachelor's degree, actually, when I was on island. Graduated. I have it now. I'm actually going to be starting for my master's. I uh, got remarried. You know, it wasn't the end of the world. Yeah, my life was a little bit empty. When I came back to the States, I didn't have a car, I didn't have a house, I didn't have my dog. All of that was gone. It was taken away from me. But I got all of that stuff back and more. So what are the lessons? Life. What are the lessons? What do you actually get out of this? So for your for supervisor, out of the epiphany that I got, you know, I'm not the first person to go through this. But I'm not the last, right? So you as supervisors, leaders, need to understand that yes, people below you or yourself might be going through it. Or even your leadership. Because it doesn't discriminate. Your decisions, you can either be creative or you can be destructive. It depends on how you choose to do that. I chose to be more creative and destructive. I can be very, very destructive but I can be just as creative. All the stripes that you see on my sleeve represent sacrifice among a great many things. Yeah, there's a lot of sacrifice. And the lowest one that I wear represents that year. But I rose. I rose out of that. And you can too. And last is resiliency. You're going to be pushed to your limits. Life is going to push you to your limits. You're going to think that you're going to break. You're not. You're not. Because you're stronger than that. Okay? There are moments that will mark your life. Moments when you realize nothing will ever be the same. Every challenge you encounter is a fork in the road. You have a choice where you will go. Our next speaker had some hard choices to make very early on in her life. But because she had the wisdom and support to choose the better path, she's here with us today to share her story. Please welcome Staff Sergeant Jacqueline Howdy. Hi everybody, it's Staff Sergeant Jacqueline Howdy. A um, little bit about me, I am a, uh, I've been in the military nine years. I am a three box shot, so information manager, but right now I'm serving as an enlisted aide to the Aspen Second Commander. 
I have been in the military for nine years. I've been stationed at Ozone Korea, Hickam, Hawaii, Little Rock, Arkansas, and now Colorado. A little bit about my personal life. Um, I don't want to get too much into it, but I was a jock in high school. Um, I was, you know, the outgoing girl, popular girl. Um, I was also the girl that was covered in head to toe in designer clothes. Everything I owned was designer. My dad was the guy that he would, um, when it came to dances, um, formals, he would spend two to three grand on me alone. Not, not, not to include the uh, limos, the hotels for after parties. On um, one year, all the parents got together and bought us a party bus. It was great. It was fun. Um, what people didn't know is that although life was great on the outside, my home life was not great. My dad is diagnosed bipolar, he, and he is an alcoholic. Um, but between the ages of 10 and sometime after I left, he didn't take his medicine because he didn't, he didn't like the way he made him feel, so he drank. And he drank every single day and heavily. Um, so he would come home and he would just have these episodes where he would, he thought that we were doing drugs behind his back, he thought we were conspiring against him, so he would, if dinner wasn't hot enough, he would just throw the plate and completely trash the house. And then one time he thought uh, I was doing drugs, so he completely tore up my bedroom, ripped clothes, ripped posters. He even got a knife and like went through, like stabbed my mattress and like was going through it. And the next day, just left me a thousand dollar check and was like, we didn't talk about it. There were days I would just dream of getting out of there, getting away, not depending on him, his money. So when it came to college, he said, I don't know if I'll pay for it. We'll see. Well, I didn't have time for that. So I was like, I'll just join the military. Easy. So three weeks before graduation, I got into a car accident. It was nothing serious, but it was definitely serious enough to where I couldn't go to the military right away. So I had back problems. So then a week after graduation, he kicked me out. And he didn't just kick me out. It was like it was premeditated because he, kicked, he uh, cut me off financially. Um, he took away my keys. He made me leave all my designer clothes. So I just left with a couple of shirts and shorts and flip flops. So then I moved in with my best friend for a little bit, but then she left early to college, and another friend who had five cats, and I'm definitely allergic, so I, that wasn't working. So then I moved in with my cousins. It was great. We had fun. We partied. We had a roof over my head. I didn't have to pay rent. I had to help out. But they were part of the Crips game. Crips game. I don't even know it anymore. <laughs> and I was okay with it because at the time it seemed great. I was like, I'm safe, I'm protected, I'm with my family. Um, I was a whole other person too at that time. Um, I had my attitude changed, um, but I, I liked it. I was safe. And then one day my two cousins, they sat me down and they're like, we are going to kick you out. I'm sorry. We love you, but you're so young, you have a clean slate. They're like, you do not want this life. You don't want it. So I was like, but this is, I don't care. This is, I feel great. Like, I, at the time, it seemed like a good idea. I'm like, no, this is what I want. My cousin's like, no, I'm sorry, you're out. You're kicking out. He's like, your only way out, if you get initiated, is prison or death. So they were like, we're, we're not going to allow that for you. So I sucked it up. And I did what I did not want to do. I moved in with my boyfriend. And we lived in these nasty apartments. It was just a bad area of town. Um, but things were great. I mean, we lived with my boyfriend. We both worked together. Um, then it started getting expensive. All we could afford was we were struggling to pay rent. So we paid rent just to make sure we had a roof over our head. But then it started where we couldn't afford food. So we started selling our coffee table, our bedside lamps, we sold um, our uh, bed frame, we sold almost everything except for the TV and our mattress. And we had one pillow one, and one sheet sleeper. Then we couldn't afford food and toiletries. For a whole year, I ate nothing but top ramen and frozen burritos, the 59 cent ones, small. No sour cream, no hot sauce. Nothing. <laughs> just, and it wasn't even like I had 
that for all three meals. It was, okay, I'm going to have top ramen for breakfast and then half a burrito for dinner. Or maybe just lunch that day. And then we couldn't afford toiletries. So at first it was like, hey, do we buy a toothpaste or do we buy a shampoo? So we went with shampoo. My teeth just got nasty yellow. Like, it was almost orange. I was like, what, what's happening? This pretty girl from high school was now tired. She was skinny, but not the good skinny. <laughs> she wasn't in shape. Um, we, I just felt smelly, I felt ashamed. This is not what I wanted for myself when I was in my room as a 16 year old dreaming of getting away. This is not what I wanted. So then it got to a point where we couldn't even afford um, shampoo, so we had to borrow soap. So between me and my boyfriend, we shared a bar of soap for our hair, our face, and our body. I don't know what you guys, but that's pretty unsanitary. <laughs> so I remember I was, uh, we had a laundry room separate, and I would walk by, and I saw this laundry detergent. And I was like, okay, it's there. I would walk by again, it's still there. A week later, it's dusty, but it's still there. So I stole it. I was like, I don't have soap. So I washed my body for a good like, three months with laundry detergent. And it wasn't the good kind. So it was, it was pretty bad when you have to wash your body with, and hands and face and hair with detergent. I felt lost, I felt scared, I felt like I was not gonna amount to anything, just like my dad always told me. And my boyfriend, he started getting into drugs, like heavy drugs, and he started selling it, so we started getting money, but I'm like, this is not how this, I don't want any part of it, trained in the Air Force. And he was just so carefree and happy, and I was stressed out all the time. My hair was falling out. Um, I, everyone saw a difference in me. They saw I looked completely different. So then one day, I was just upset. I was like, I can't do this anymore. I'm stressed out. So I go downstairs, and I want to indulge with him with the drugs. And I'm like, you know what? I don't want to feel. If he's okay to not feel, and he's happy, Maybe that's what I need. So I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, I'm like, you know what, okay, whatever. At this point, I don't care. I don't care. But then as soon as I'm like, you know, getting myself prepared mentally, I don't know why, I don't know what to do. So I get like a, like a, not like a flash, flashback, but like a flash forward. Like, what if the Air Force calls me tomorrow? Then that's it. I'm blacklisted from all of services. Then I'm really stuck there. So I just walk in. So by this point, it's summer, a year later, summer 2008, and my best friend comes back from, from college, and I hang out with her for a week. She's like, come hang out with me before I go on vacation. I said, okay, let's do this. Let me get away. Her mom immediately notices the difference. She's like, oh, I have this extra shampoo and conditioner and loofah with the textile on it that you can have. And um, she gave me just a bag full of stuff, and a loofah and floss was a luxury. Like, things that I buy now in bulk was a luxury back then. And I'm just like, why? I get my own loofah, I get my own floss, I can take this. Do you think shampoo, conditioner, face wash? I'll take it all. So, um, before my friend, they, they were going to Hawaii, so I um, hung out with them that week, and then my friend dropped me off, and her mom gave me groceries. So she dropped me, dropped me off at home, and my boyfriend was having a party. We didn't have money for food or toiletries, but he had money for a party. So this was my turning point. I went for a walk. I put the groceries away, and I went for a walk. And I remember walking, and I look over, and this lady had her two kids, boy and a girl, playing outside. But I kind of see her, her apartment had, is furnished. I'm like, okay, she can take care of her kid. And I'm walking, and all of a sudden you hear, a car pull up, I'm like, pop, pop, pop. and you're like, so then, and then you hear another, pop, pop, pop. and it was a drive-by. I remember jumping behind a pillar, and so I, I look over, and she gets her kids and throws them into the apartment. I just throw, like, chucks them, and she's behind the pillar. She's crying. They're crying, and I wasn't crying. I was just scared. I mean, I was shaking. I was like, they duck down, but I'm like, if I get hit, is that really the worst thing? It was just terrible to think. So then in that moment, when gunshots are going off around me, it seemed like forever, but it was probably like five seconds. 
I'm thinking, is this the life that I want? In that moment when gunshots are going off, I'm thinking, what if I get pregnant by this guy and I have to raise my kids here? Like in that moment, I'm like, I need to get out of here. This is not the life that I want. So I, when all that was over, I called my grandma and texted her in Del Rio, Texas, and I said, I, I just need help. Because everyone else in my family in California pushed me away, shut the door on me. And I guess she had been trying to get a hold of me as well. So I went to my boyfriend and I'm like, hey, in two weeks I'm moving to Del Rio, Texas. Sorry. Like, I can't do this. This isn't the life I wanted. This isn't like you promised me. I can't do this. So he got mad, said, are you abandoning us? Or my band's going to take off one day. And I was like, when it does, send me a ticket. I'll be there front row. Like, I'll be there. So I moved to Del Rio, and then I joined the Air Force from there. And I was just so grateful that I can get out of that lifestyle. I'm grateful that I didn't um, go to the gang lifestyle. I just, I got away and I accomplished my dreams. So I joined the military in October of 2008. Um, a little update, I got married. We have a boy, about to have a girl. And I do think about that cup, that lady with her two kids. I think about what my life could have been if I had joined the gang. And, and how to raise my kids in that lifestyle. How much danger they'd be in, how much danger I'd be in all the time. I think about what would happen if I did drugs and didn't get a chance to join the military and do great things and make this, be this great man and have my beautiful son. And, and I just could not imagine raising my kids, my son and my daughter in that lifestyle. Like, I couldn't be able to, I couldn't take care of myself. My son now, his curly hair, I don't know if you can see it behind the belly. He has his own special conditioner, so it stays cooling. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even know where to go. <laughs> like I, I just it's 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 hard to think about sometimes, but um, I have bad days. I have bad weeks. I even have a bad month sometimes. But I never do anything that'll ruin my entire life. And um you know, when my cousin was kicking me out, you know, for being, you know, a gangster, he was like, you know, don't do something. Just because you're having a bad time, don't do something that will negatively impact your life forever. But she was right, and I do. Sometimes I, I get mad, you know, we all have bad days in the airport, so I'm like, I'm getting out tomorrow, that's it. <laughs> or my husband doesn't put the toothpaste cap on, I'm like, I'm divorcing him, that's it. <laughs> I don't do that, because you, you can't do that to yourself. You have to allow yourself to heal and, and work through it because you always come up stronger. I know I did. A um, little, just little update, my cousin. So unfortunately, my cousin, um, one of them's in prison and the other one, he died in the game fight. Um, my ex-boyfriend, I saw him back in 2015. He, we didn't recognize each other. He's sunken in. He has, um, him and his girlfriend had like track marks. Of you know, their arms and legs. They, they got into some pretty heavy stuff. So I always think that could have been my life. And I could have, that could have been me. I wouldn't be here talking to you guys, working for amazing people, working with amazing people. Um, and to this day, I refuse to eat top ramen. Our next speaker has a story that is shared by nearly 45 thousand Americans each year. This growing epidemic is the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. Hers is a story that resounds with wingmanship, fortitude, and courage. Please welcome Lieutenant Colonel Stephanie Forsyth. Good morning, everyone. So I'm here today to tell you my story about being resilient, overcoming challenges in your life, and the importance of having a good wingman and being a good wingman. Um, just to kind of start, at the beginning growing up, I was a part of an Air Force family, kind of military brat, grew up, moved all around, lived lots of places, so generally had a pretty good life. Uh, you know, going into my adolescent years, I um, just struggled a little bit with self-esteem and not really depression, but just not feeling like I fit in. 
Um, that seemed pretty normal. I mean, most you know, young <laughs> people, uh, teenagers, I think, struggle with things like that. So that was pretty normal. Um, however, into uh, my teenage years, in the span of about three to four years, I uh, was sexually abused by two family members. So when that happened, I knew that wasn't normal, um, but I also didn't really know how to handle that or what to do, do to deal with that, and so I didn't. Um, I ended up just basically, um, once it stopped, trying to forget about it, I kind of buried it in my brain, you know, compartmentalized it, and just ignored it because I was in high school and there were things I wanted to accomplish and goals I wanted to achieve, and so I was focused on that. So I stayed focused on that, and uh, you know I felt like okay, we're good to go. So fast forward a few years, I uh, go through college. I graduate from college, and so now I'm at the age of 23, and I have a doctor of pharmacy degree, and I'm a captain in the Air Force. I just joined the Air Force, and I thought life was good. Everything is great. You know, I've accomplished my goal. I graduated from college, and I'm going to make something of myself. And so it was good. I uh, started to build a social support uh, network there at my first assignment and had a good group of friends. Uh, we were doing well, but then um, I started having problems sleeping. That's really kind of how it all started. I ended up just not really being able to sleep and I, I didn't know why. I felt like, you know, things were good. So once I um, realized that it wasn't going to go away, I, I went to the doctor, just my PCM, and. You know, they just gave me some medication uh, to help me sleep, and I was like, all right, well, this will take care of it, and we'll be good. Um, a couple months after I started taking uh, the first medication they gave me, um, I started having some dreams uh, while I was sleeping, and they weren't really dreams. They were uh, memories and flashbacks of the sexual abuse that had happened to me. So I wasn't prepared for that to come up in my life again at that time. It had been many years. I felt like, I guess I had just moved on from it, but really I hadn't, I suppose. It was still there. So um, I started having those dreams, and then I didn't want to sleep, so I knew I needed some more help, and I, I went to mental health. Um, and I started counseling with them, and they you know, were helpful. They you know, were talking to me with things, but these things kept coming through, and they were coming through during the day now, and you know, really just kind of rocking my world and, and making it so that I didn't know what to do, you know. Um, but, like I said, I had my group of friends, and by that time, I was living with two of my roommates, one of which my, was my best friend, Rachel. And, uh, and so we were just like normal, I think, young, you know, adults, and we, We'd go out on the weekends and drink and things, and I think I wanted to drink to more help me sleep or to, you know, just kind of not have to worry about these things that were were coming up in my life. So um, once, but it, that, but that drinking wasn't something that was excessive. It wasn't having an impact on my ability to work. I was still performing very well at work. I had won a couple awards. I was the vice president of the company grade officer council on the base. So on the outside, everything looked great. You know, I was fine, really, according to you know anybody that you talk to. Uh, but inside, there was this recurring thing that was just really difficult, and I um, kind of knew I needed more help, but I didn't know how to get it or what else to do because I had gone to get help. Um, so. About a year after I joined the Air Force, I, a little over a year after I joined the Air Force, I remember uh, one day I was at home with my roommates in the evening, looking back on that day, there was nothing that stands out about that day. There was nothing out of the ordinary at work. I don't remember actually seeing mental health or anything that day, talking about anything, triggering anything. But um, that evening I had um, gone upstairs to go to bed and I remember going into the bathroom and opening a drawer to get something and there was a bottle of Ambien in that drawer that I had been prescribed you know, maybe about a month before that um, I had only taken a couple tablets because I didn't like how it made me feel the next day at work. I didn't feel like I could work very well and so I just felt like, okay, you know, maybe I'll take it every once in a while so I kept it but it was there. So I saw that bottle of pills 
And I remember, just for a split second, having a thought cross my mind that I could just take this whole bottle of pills and that's going to change something. Something needs to change and this will change it. And so I grabbed it and I did. That's what I did. I took the whole bottle. So after I did that, I am... Um, being a pharmacist, I know the danger of overdose and medications and, and things like that, so I knew that I was probably going to be in trouble. Um, but when that thought crossed my mind and I chose to take that action, this logical and rational part of my brain just wasn't really engaged for a couple minutes. I'm not sure why, but it wasn't. And then there was kind of something underneath after I did it that I was like, oh no, now what? And so I went back downstairs and I said to my roommate, my best friend Rachel, hey, can you please come check on me before you go to bed? And I told her that I loved her and I went back upstairs. Now, of course, she felt that was odd. I had already been downstairs and told her good night and said that I was going to bed. So she knew it was out of the ordinary. Um, and she was like, okay, well, all right. So about an hour later, she came up to my room, but she didn't just like look in my room. You know, she actually came physically to check on me. You know, she turned on the light and came to the bed and she tried to wake me up and she couldn't really wake me up. So she woke up my other roommate and they called 911 and obviously ambulance came, emergency um, care, things like that. So, um, but before I had got back into my bed, I had left that bottle, the empty bottle, on my nightstand and I had wrote a note about exactly what I took and how much I took. And so I knew that if I was going to get help, that would help whoever was helping me to hopefully, you know, maybe save my life. Um, so the next thing that I remember uh, was waking up in the ER. I remember, my memory of that time is pretty foggy, but I remember waking up, I remember having a tube in my throat, I remember my best friend being there, or my other roommate being there. I remember I just kept asking what happened, where I was, things like that. She said she had to, you know, multiple times over the first few hours tell me again and again what happened. Um, it took me about two days to recover physically. I felt, you know, like I, I kind of felt more like myself physically, I, I felt good, I uh, felt a little bit better, and things like that. So I ended up, um, after they were comfortable that I was good physically, then I um, went into an inpatient mental health uh, treatment that was for about a week. Um, and the purpose of that was really for them to do a workup to figure out what was going on. Um, and after that, they determined that I just um, was essentially having post-traumatic stress and um, an adjustment disorder. Just, uh, and so then I transitioned to, into an outpatient uh, therapy program. Uh, that program was about three weeks long, I think, three to four weeks. Um, and so I was there every day and that program was really, really helpful for me. Um, it taught me a lot of things, not just about myself, but about life in general. Um, but there were you know, three big things that, that I learned from that program. Um, one of them was that attitude is a little thing that can make a big difference. I learned that you have a choice on how you are going to approach life. You can choose to be negative or you can choose to be positive. You can choose to fight to overcome things that have happened in your life or you can choose to just hide within yourself. Um, and so I started to learn how to basically deal with uh, the things that have happened to me and finding a way to overcome them rather than burying them. And so that, that's the next lesson, is that um, trying to bury things or compartmentalize things and pretend like they didn't happen and that you can just forget about them didn't work for me. Uh, you know, and so looking back now, I think that the reason I chose to take that bottle of pills and attempt suicide was because I was really scared 
with things that were coming up, the memories and things that were coming up in my life, and I knew that I needed help, but I just didn't know what else to do. Um, I wish now that I would have gone downstairs and said, hey, I just had this thought and it's really scary, but I just wasn't really thinking clearly at the time. So <clears throat> compartmentalizing things typically doesn't work long term. Maybe short term it'll work, but then eventually you're going to have to deal with stuff that happens in your life. So it's best to just face it head on and, and get the help that you need because uh, the help is there. Um, and the uh, other lesson that I learned uh, from that experience is that letting go is not forgetting. So letting go of the emotional baggage that you carry around, that all of us carry around, that I carried around, so that negative self-talk, the guilt, the blame, the shame, the self-doubt, all those things, that emotional baggage that you carry around, letting go of it isn't forgetting about it. Letting go of it is accepting it, recovering from it, and using it to make you a better person, to make you stronger. Um, so, all that happened about uh, 14 years ago now, a little uh, less than 14 years ago now. And so, um, I've been able to recover. I, you know, here I am before you today, a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force. I have had a I think pretty successful career up until this point. Obviously, there's still some career ahead of me, and there's things I want to accomplish and do. But um, the one thing I, I do got to go back for is after I had gotten out of the outpatient program, I couldn't really go back to work um, because as a pharmacist, you take a whole bottle of pills. That's not really a good look for you, right? So <laughs> they uh, <laughs> they were kind of like, uh, you can't go back in the pharmacy. So we need to kind of figure out what's going on. So um, I ended up having to continue to see, but it was good, I, I wanted to continue to see a psychiatrist for about a year following my suicide attempt. And about six months into that uh, time period, I was able to get back to work. I was able to go back to my old job in charge of the pharmacy, in the pharmacy, working as a pharmacist. And um, that, that was a little bit difficult because I, I really felt like I had let my team down. You know, I was supposed to be their leader, but I, di I didn't, you know, do a good job in doing that at that time. But I was able to fight back and I was able to show them that you can recover, that you can come back. And so that was important to me, but I, I feel like it was impactful to them. Um, and I really am thankful that they were willing to, you know, accept me back in and trust me again. Um, and so, um, so again, that was um, that was a little bit of a, a challenge getting back into that. Um, so, again, here I am, you know, now, 14 years later. And when I first came in the Air Force, any lieutenant colonel or higher or even you know majors that I had met, um, I didn't think anything like this could have happened to them in their past. They, you know, they were, you know, perfect. Basically, they had achieved all these great things, but. I'm here as proof that every one of us is human. Everybody has challenges in their life, no matter what. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not there. Everybody has a story in their life. And so I, I want you to remember that, but the takeaways that I want you to, to take from this story, from my story, is that, um, number one, if you need help, even if you don't really know exactly what kind of help you need or how to get it, be persistent and advocate for yourself until you get the help that you need. There is lots of help available to us. We are so lucky in the military. We have this military family. We have all these great resources. You just need to let them help you. Um, indirectly, I ended up getting the help that I needed, but the path that I chose to get that help, I would not recommend. Um, second, um, you can be successful in over, and overcome difficult times and challenges in your life. There are going to be obstacles. That's just part of life. But you can overcome them. You can become better. You can become stronger. So adversity in your life does not prevent success. Adversity in your life actually leads to success. You can have something like this 
happen or any of these stories that you're going to hear today. Difficult times in life, overcoming them makes you so much stronger and better. And then you can help other people. Um, and the last thing that I want you uh, to take away is that the importance of having a good wingman and really being a good wingman. If you see something or hear something from somebody that you're close to, whether it's a loved one, colleague, family, friend, whatever it is, do something. Take action. I am really thankful that I went downstairs and said something to my roommate, but I'm more thankful that she actually took action and did something. She probably saved my life that day. And without that, I wouldn't be here being able to tell you my story and hopefully help you. So I know you hear it all the time, you know, be a good wingman, be a, but it's true. Actually being a good wingman or having a good wingman can save a life. So please carry that forward and thank you very much. For your time. Well, the military culture honors those who are courageous, self-determined and goal-driven. Our next speaker is motivated to be his best. But even those who look driven and talented on the outside often have struggles no one can see on the inside. Our next speaker hit the wall, stumbled, and found a way to keep going. Please welcome Captain Sean Sindler. So I'm not here this morning because my story is some crazy thing that nobody would ever go through. I think actually it's fairly common. So uh, it's a story of transformation, of a life that I thought was great, but was missing things. And through the adversity of depression and the mental health counseling that I got, I now have the kind of life that I'm happy with and then I feel I can go forward. So, I just sort of give a little setup of who I was before all of this. Um, I, I had grown up um, on a house uh, at least 10 acres in the middle of nowhere. So, no families around. Uh, we basically just had our parents and uh, my four siblings. Um, I was pretty introverted. Uh, independent, um, honest, kind of trying to be adventurous, wanted to get out of this, you know, kind of trap of a house with no, nothing around. Um, then I joined the Air Force, and the Air Force added three core values, and I thought, wow, this makes sense. Okay, so I added those, and it was good. And um, then... I'll flash forward now. Uh, I've been in the Air Force a few years. I'm stationed in Germany, and uh, I'm dating uh, the woman who would become my wife. Uh, you can see here we are uh, traveling around in Germany in the summer of 2003, um, having a great old time. Uh, a few months later, we go ahead and get married, which was awesome. Um, now she's living with me permanently in Germany, and you, uh, you can see here I, I had 14 members of my family and five members of her family. Uh, converge on our house in Germany and they couldn't talk to each other but it was fun, it was a, it was a good time um, and then uh, we have a so a few months later I deploy to Iraq and um, I get a little bit of this adventure, I, I mean I'm supposed to be deployed to Iraq in a combat zone doing military stuff and I'm at the ziggurat of Ur like the capitalist American empire a thousand years ago Who, it was crazy, so, so things were pretty cool. Uh, keep moving forward, I get back, you know, I'm moving on with life, we have a son, then we move to Korea again, um, and then we have another child, our daughter, uh, this is from uh, her first birthday, and uh, you know, I, I just think life's amazing, you know, it, it, and it was, it was great. But, uh, but like I say, I was missing things. So, uh, flash forward now, uh, to January of 2016 and it's a pretty pivotal thing that I didn't even recognize was pivotal at the time is uh, <laughs> as 
my mom passed away. It wasn't a shock. She had been sick for a long time. Uh, so she, she had um, degenerative mental disease, essentially like Alzheimer's, but uh, slight different variation with behavior changes and stuff. But, uh, but I, was, I was busy, right? Because I was an introvert, I was independent, um, I was a workaholic, uh, kind of like my dad. Uh, and, um, and, you know, I had a wife and two kids, and uh, we had a dog, and we were getting ready to PCS to back to Germany again, which we had wanted to be there ever since we left in 2006. Uh, and in the next month, February of 2016, we were, we're back in Germany, uh, where we had wanted to be, and, and we're excited, and we're just on top of the world. But, uh, but I never took the time uh, to do that grieving process that uh, Sergeant Roberts had talked about. So I knew about it. I mean, I had heard, I had been in the Air Force at this point uh, since 1999. I mean, I had heard plenty of uh, suicide awareness. I had heard all the kind of briefings everybody gets every year. And, uh, but, but I just, I, the things I'm missing are uh, any sort of valuation of importance uh, or any sort of value of recognizing my emotions and recognizing the value of friends. So I, I just didn't, I, I didn't know. Uh, I thought, hey, if work's going great and my wife and kids are going great, then life's good and that's all you need. Um, but, I, but I start to get some troubles. So I, I keep doing the same thing I'm always doing. Uh, I had come from Osan where it was, uh, it was an amazing experience uh, with a small unit. Everybody was super close. Uh, everybody had thick skins. You could just say anything in debrief, and uh, nobody took it personal. You just you try to gather a lesson learned and you move on, right? I, I thought, okay, boom, let's do this in NATO. But uh, but NATO Air Base Island Kirch is a little different. So first of all, NATO doesn't well. NATO uh, some people call it not after two o'clock. Right? They it, working hard is not a value there. So. It's not that uh, people don't want to get anything done, but uh, they, they don't want to have to sacrifice in order to get it done. So, uh, but I go, we go to this training ex exercise uh, called Tactical Leadership Program, TLP, in Albacete, Spain. And I am just like in high gear, like showing up early, just, you know, trying to mission plan, make suggestions, everything. And, uh, and they're like, whoa, what is this guy doing? They, they, they just like, the, the reaction was like, in, entirely negative. Why is this guy trying to learn? We're just here to have fun and party. What, what's going on? And so, uh, so now I get back uh, after this, and, uh, and now I got all these rumors around that uh, this guy similar thinks he's better than everybody. And, uh, and he won't listen to people who tell him to be quiet uh, because he thinks that he knows everything and he wants to talk all the time. And, uh, and it's just weird. It's, I felt like rumors happened in high school, but they don't happen when you're in your 30s as a captain in a NATO professional flying organization. And so I just, I thought, you know what? All I gotta do, I just gotta work hard and, and, and everything will be fine, right? It had worked so far. Uh, but it didn't work this time. So, because uh, I would work hard at work, and, and I was getting all this negative feedback and, uh, and everybody, you know, it was just like Sindler is bad, Sindler is terrible. And then I would get home and, and I would work hard and, and then, you know, uh, I, I had a very uh, short temper because I was just getting so much stress at work and it was coming out at home. And it, so my wife and I were going through a lot of troubles and my kids too and it was, it was bad. So things, we started to get this downward spiral. And uh, it was pretty ugly. Um, so it was just getting worse and worse and worse. Uh, finally, my commander, she just hears all these negative rumors about me. And instead of, uh, instead of asking me, hey, what's the real deal here, Sindler? Uh, she just, she makes, a, she makes a determination that she thinks, hey, this guy needs to move. So he's the problem. Let's get him out of the squadron where the troubles are happening with, between him and his coworkers, right? So she moves me to another squadron. Uh, she didn't ask me whether I want to move or, or anything. I was the uh, chief of uh, tactics and exercises uh, in my NATO Flying Squadron 1, and it was amazing. I, I loved it. Uh, I, I actually could take the stuff I had learned at Tinker, uh, on USAWACS, at CRC, at, uh, in Korea, 
uh, all of my time, nine years enlisted, at that point, you know, quite a few years officer, and uh, and make positive changes in, in NATO. But, uh, but that's not how my leadership saw it. They said, nope, this guy's making trouble, so we're gonna shove him over. We're gonna put him in the training squadron, and uh, we're gonna tell him that it's good because he can be an instructor there and he'll be happy. Uh, but that was really false because they didn't want me to be an instructor. So I was taking an instructor slot, uh, but without letting me go through I up. So now I felt like I was a drag on the team because I couldn't, it was a 40 hour work week and 90% of it was instructing. So now I couldn't do 36 hours of the 40 hour work week and I could not show up to work and it didn't matter. Nobody cared because the work would still get done whether I did it or not. And, uh, and, and he, uh, so the troubles keep piling up, the, the work at home, the, the stress at home is leading me to do things I shouldn't have done. And uh, there was, my kids were home at spring break and uh, my, my daughter's yelling at me and, uh, and I slap her in the face. And a few days later, um, playing my, with my son, I'm tickling him and he's kicking me and, and I punch him. And uh, my wife's like, nope, that's the last straw. And so she goes to family advocacy and, uh, and she reports me for, uh, she accused me of child abuse. And uh, at this point, man, April 2017, it's like, wow. I've never been so low. And this is where I needed those emotional connections. This is where I needed those friends. Because I had always been able, when things were not good at work, you know, I could look to my wife and kids and say, man, everything is great at home, it's okay. And when things were not great at home, I could look at my work and say, man, everything's great at work, it's okay. Well, I'll get through this. Uh, but I've met my threshold. And, uh, and so finally May comes around and, uh, and I just don't know what to do. I don't like my life at all. I go to work and I hate it. I go home, I hate it. And I, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to get out of it. And so I, didn't, I knew I didn't want suicide. No, it's not the answer, right? I mean, I, everybody knows that. But, uh, but, but I didn't know. I didn't know how to get out of this. And so I walked into a lake one day. I, it was the day I was supposed to fly. And uh, I said, nope, I'm not going to fly. I'm going to walk into this lake and I'm going to. I'm gonna see about maybe drown myself, I don't know. And so I go in there and I, I uh, put my hand in the water a few times and I can't do it. Uh, I mean, I get to the edge and I pull back and you know, it's just, it's, I, I know it's not for me, but, but I don't know how to get out of the lake and, and move on with my life. So I just sit there and then eventually my squadron, uh, they, they send a search party out. They got, they, they call the German police, they got helicopters and stuff, it's crazy. And uh, so they, they eventually find me and uh, they get me back to our house and holy oh, man, I thought I had been in control of my life, my career, not anymore. All gone, all the control completely eliminated. So they, uh, they get me on a bus, they take me down to uh, Launchville Regional Medical Center, the uh, lockup psych ward. I'm down there for a week, they, they, they diagnose me, major depressive disorder, recurrent moderates. They say, oh yeah, you had depressive episodes earlier in your life, oh man. You're bad. So now I get back after a week there, and I say, well, let's, let's just try to get back to normal, right? Uh, well, no, my, uh, my commander, my flight doc, and my mental health provider, I call them the trio, right? So the trio here, they, they had all control, 100%. So they could write whatever they wanted in my medical records. They could write whatever they wanted. My commander could write her commander impact statement uh, for my med board. She recommended separation. Don't retain this guy. He's never gonna be able to do his job again. He's never gonna be able to get a flying waiver. So the one positive thing is uh, I actually went to a seven week uh, residential treatment program for depression at, uh, in the Netherlands Public Youth Center. And uh, there, that was the beginning of my new life. So they taught me a couple of main things here. Um, one was this thing called the five pillars of psychological well-being. So the first three were obvious to me, eat right, sleep right, um, get some exercise, right? I mean, everybody knows that. Um, 
I had already been doing those, but the last two, these were the profound ones for me. Um, social content. For me, man, I had thought, I don't need that. I got work, I got a wife and kids. Who needs social contact? But apparently people need that stuff. So uh, it's actually uh, kind of important. So I, now I, I realize that like, okay, all right, I'll build that pillar up. Okay, all right, that sounds good. And then the next pillar was uh, work, rest, relaxation, balance. And uh, you know, I, I've been a workaholic, like I say, um, it, it worked, right? I mean, I left Korea with a number one of seven chop chief strap. And I was, I was like, man, this is great because I had worked my butt off in Korea. And, uh, and I thought, well, I mean, I got a reward for it, so I'll keep doing that. But, uh, but it turns out that only lasts for so long, right? So eventually you get overwhelmed, and when you don't have that pillar, you don't, when you're, when you're working so much, and then you come home, and all you can do is work and sleep, work and sleep, you get no time for your brain to just sort of like sit and do what it needs to do, and, uh, and relax. And so now I realize that, okay, all right, now I gotta build that in. I gotta figure out how I can make my work, rest, relaxation, balance work. And then the second biggest thing was an emotional connection. I saw people at the youth center who were just like me. They were, they were down and they had all these troubles and, and they didn't try to shove them in the corner and like pretend they didn't exist. They would just throw their heart on the floor and just, you know? And, and it worked for them. Like, I couldn't believe it. Like, that actually made people stronger when they talked about all these emotions that they felt. And so I was like, wow, that is cool. I want that. And so, but I couldn't do it. I, I, I was in this seven-week program, and I would go home on the weekends. And, uh, and then you're supposed to do a little reintegration meeting with your, uh, your coworkers before you go back so that they know how you did in your recovery, and they know how to treat you, and what I'm going to get back, and all that. And, you know, you don't get work too hard or too little, whatever. But instead, it was the trio who came out to see me about two weeks before I left. And uh, instead of talking about how I can go back in the unit and be useful again, they had a complete opposite opinion. They said, we're going to med board you. And uh, not only are we med boarding you, but we don't want you in our MTF anymore. We don't want you in our squadron anymore. So they brought this commander's impact later that said, hey, separate this guy. Don't retain him. And, uh, and they were like, hey, you can make a comment if you want, you know, sign it right now, get back to us. And also this other people is, hey, we're going to send you back to the States. Um, we don't care whether you want to stay or not, but the, we're going to do it. So just tell us where you want to go and then we'll go ahead and get the orders all made up for you. And I said, no, 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 hold on. I, I, I actually, I feel like I'm recovered now. Can I just get back to work? Can I, can I? They're like, no, 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 no. That, that time is over. Again, the trio had control, right? So... They made it happen. I got out 31 August. I got back and I fight to try to not get PCS out of GK. Even though it was the place who, you know, that where all the trouble started, I, uh, I still wanted to be there. My wife loved it. I mean, we were best friends with our neighbors who were also our landlords. Our kids had all their friends in school. Um, but my commander still hated me. So. Uh, luckily, actually, uh, we were able to get here to Peterson Air Force Base, Colorado. We got here uh, 24 October, and um, sometimes the distance from the troubles actually, uh, as has already been referenced, can be all the difference in the world. And so here I'm able to actually implement these five pillars and implement the emotional stuff, the, the connection with myself and others that I wanted to do there, but I, it, it was still like a toxic environment. And so, yeah, am I going through my med board? Yeah, sure. I just went down to Randolph uh, earlier this week. I got my results yesterday that uh, they think that I need to be permanently retired because I'll never get a flying waiver. Um, I'm going to fight it, right? Um, because I don't feel like, just like it's already been said, I don't feel like my illness determines who I am. So... Anything that I, you know, want you guys to take away from my experience is, uh, you know, there's a lot of introverts out there. There's a lot of people who think that hard work is everything, uh, but there's more to life than that. Uh, I feel like that social contact is important. I feel like the emotional connection is important. And I feel like that 
that work rest relaxation balance is important and I feel like as has already been said adversity makes us stronger the lowest point of my life was actually the beginning of I feel the greatest times in my life so Don and I met at the University of Texas you'll see the theme of our family picture is the burnt orange of components. 17 years of marriage, well, I'll, I'll go back a little bit because I will tell you I'm an uber extrovert. I know that when I walk into a room, much like Rogue from X-Men, she can suck the physical strength out of people. I can suck the air out of an introvert's lungs. In college, I walk into a party and I survey the room and I notice that there is one person I do not know in that room. I make a beeline right to him. Hi, I'm Kristen Anderson. He said, hi, I'm John Christie. We can never get married. <laughs> so what kind of pickup line is that? <laughs> and he saw the confused look on my face and he said, you would become Kristen Christie. Five months later, we were engaged. Two years later, we were married. 17 years of marriage. Two active, fun-loving, very different <laughs> boys. Three PCSs, a deployment to Baghdad. Transition from active duty to active reserves. A fabulous year at Carlisle Barracks for Army War College. And we get stationed back here in Colorado Springs in 2006 with your first basement. Our lives start coming. And in April 21st of 2008, the doorbell it's the chaplain from the sheriff's department in the home. Don had taken his life at Black Forest Park. Life is a tough teacher. You get the top thing, and then you learn the lesson. Our boys were 12 and 14. Eight years later, on our youngest son's birthday, Ben, on his 20th birthday, he leaves me this voice message. <laughs> I did that. I can't. I need it right now. I need a oh. I just need someone right now. <laughs> I need that right now. I can't go without him. It's been the worst year of my life. <laughs> Mommy, I'm not okay. I'm not okay right now, Mom. I really need help. I really need help. I really need an answer. <laughs> Can you hear it? Can you hear the pain and the desperation in my baby's voice? Our oldest son was 14. Ryan. I need to listen to this. Can you 
hear it? Can you hear this moth heartbreaking? September 15th, or September 20th of 2015 is the last time I heard or saw my 901 days today. My son has been missing. What we didn't know was Ryan was bipolar. If you know anything about being bipolar, it typically presents itself in the early 20s to mid-20s. Ryan was diagnosed at 16 years old. And I contend that if he had had those five, six, seven years to mature, he would not have self-medicated with meth and heroin. He became clean himself and was clean for four years or three years before he disappeared at his own accord. A report was just released by Columbia University saying suicide is contagious. For the four months after Robin Williams' suicide, the suicide rate went up 10%. Life is a tough teacher. You get the test first, and then you learn the lesson. There's something else that's contagious. In my family, what's left of it is ready to talk about. That smiles are contagious. You got it? Let me shoot it out to you. You got it? The average person has 44 people within their sphere of influence. I want you to remember that as you make choices in your career and in your life. We live in a world of acronyms in the military. So I'd like to offer you a few acronyms. Hope. Hold on, pain eases. Now some people give the definition of the acronym hope as hold on, pain ends. With this kind of pain, it doesn't end. It never will. But it does ease. It'll be 10 years this April since Don passed away. We have another acronym that we use in the military and really all over in, a, in the private sector as well. And that's PTS. Post-traumatic stress. You don't have to be in a combat zone to have it. And I think the speakers you've heard and the speakers you'll hear after me will agree that they have some form of PTS. We'd like to change that acronym. We'd like to change it to PTG, post-traumatic growth. How do you grow from the experiences you've, ex you've had in your life, whether they've been good or bad? It's our choice. We have a choice of how we react. When you make a choice, people have to live with that choice. Remember the 44 people within your sphere of influence? So if you can help one person, you aren't helping just one person, you're helping 45. If one person dies, it affects 44 people, an average of 44 people for the rest of their lives. Life is a brutal teacher. 
you get the test first and then you're in blessing. I made mistakes. Some people will say, Kristen, this is karma. And I have to live with this. And that's for another time, another story. But what I have opted to do to turn my PTS into PTG, something good, growth, we are all survivors of something. Lost job, broken heart, death, illness, you name it. You're a survivor. We have a National Ice Cream Day, May 17th. I think the congressman from Vermont, where Ben and Jerry's is headquartered, <laughs> decided to come up with that. We have Heart Awareness Month in February. We have Stroke Awareness Month in May. I'm a stroke survivor. I'm very involved with stroke awareness in the month of May. October is, stroke, is uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. We don't have a Survivor's Day. So I've been working with our community, the city council, the county commissioners and the state of Colorado have proclaimed a Survivor's Day. Perseverance in the face of adversity. And I'm trying to work with the White House because I want it as an executive order. It's a day that we can hold our head up high and hold, pull our shoulders back, say we have survived and how do we help other people? So no matter what the obstacle, we put one foot in front of the other and we march forth and conquer. March 4th is the day for survivors. But it's not just one day. It was last Sunday. It's not just one day. September 20th every year is my march forth. I put one foot in front of the other, and it may be a baby step, but I go forth. April 21st, every year is March 4th for me. I have chosen that every day in my life will be March 4th. I just have to remember when I write a check, not to be March 4th. <laughs> That has given me and my family hope. So how do we collectively, as a military community, we all family, we've heard speakers today talk about how our family is not necessarily who we are siblings with or who our parents are. It is sometimes those we choose to be around. But our military, our Air Force, is our family. There are safety nets. There are times when I don't want to march forth. I need a piggyback ride. I need to put my arms around someone and I need them to help me. Or two people. You can either go it alone or you can go at it with friends. I really recommend the friend route because it's a lot more fun. How can we help each other? We can't solve each other's problems, but we can be noticers. Do you have a coworker who no longer has a family picture on their desk? Do you have a coworker who is an extrovert, but they've been off for a few days? They aren't that extrovert. They aren't that tigger. Again, you can't solve their problems, but if you notice and you go up to them and give an ear or a hug or a handshake or a smile, it's contagious. It means the world. It absolutely means the world. There is a saying that I love, and I just heard it from Chief Boyer of the Air Force Academy. It takes nothing away from a lit candle to light another candle. But what the, it does give is more light. So 
Suicide is a tough subject. It is not tough. But silence does it no good. And my family and I are ready to talk about it. To talk about the hope. Because life is a tough teacher. We get the test first. How do we become the tutor for the lesson? And together we can march forward and come. So Don and I met at the University of Texas. You'll see the theme of our family picture is the burnt orange of components. 17 years of marriage, well, I'll, I'll go back a little bit because I will tell you I'm an uber extrovert. I know that when I walk into a room, much like Rogue from X-Men, she can suck the physical strength out of people. I can suck the air out of an introvert's lungs. In college, I walk into a party and I survey the room and I notice that there is one person I do not know in that room. I make a beeline right to him. Hi, I'm Kristen Anderson. He said, hi, I'm John Christie. We can never get married. <laughs> so what kind of pickup line is that? <laughs> and he saw the confused look on my face and he said, you would become Kristen Christie. Five months later, we were engaged. Two years later, we were married. 17 years of marriage. Two active, fun-loving, very different <laughs> boys, three PCSs, a deployment to Baghdad, transition from active duty to active reserves, a fabulous year at Carlisle Barracks for Army War College. And we get stationed back here in Colorado Springs in 2006 with your first basement. Our lives start coming. And in April 21st of 2008, the doorbell is. It's the chaplain from the sheriff's department in the corner. Don had taken his life at Black Forest Park. Life is a tough teacher. You get the top thing, and then you learn the lesson. Our boys were 12 and 14. Eight years later, on our youngest son's birthday, Ben, on his 20th birthday, he leaves me this voice message. I need it right now. I need a more. I just need someone right now, Ma. 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 I need that right now. I can't go without him. It's been the worst year of my life. <laughs> Mommy, I'm not okay. I'm not okay right now, Mom. I really need help. I really need help. I really need an answer. <laughs> Can you hear it? Can you 
clear to the pain and the desperation in my baby's voice. Our oldest son was 14. Ryan, I need you to listen to this. Can you hear it? Can you hear this mom's heartbreaking? September 15th, or September 20th of 2015 is the last time I heard or saw my 901 days today. My son has been missing. What we didn't know was Ryan was bipolar. If you know anything about being bipolar, it typically presents itself in the early 20s to mid-20s. Ryan was diagnosed at 16 years old. And I contend that if he had had those five, six, seven years to mature, he would not have self-medicated with meth and heroin. He became clean himself and was clean for four years or three years before he disappeared at his own accord. A report was just released by Columbia University saying suicide is contagious. For the four months after Robin Williams' suicide, the suicide rate went up 10%. Life is a tough teacher. You get the test first, and then you learn the lesson. There's something else that's contagious. In my family, what's left of it is ready to talk about that smiles are contagious. You got it? Let me shoot it out to you. You got it? The average person has 44 people within their sphere of influence. I want you to remember that as you make choices in your career and in your life. We live in a world of acronyms in the military. So I'd like to offer you a few acronyms. Hope. Hold on, pain eases. Now some people give the definition of the acronym hope as hold on, pain ends. With this kind of pain, it doesn't end. It never will. But it does ease. It'll be 10 years this April since Don passed away. We have another acronym that we use in the military and really all over in, a, in the private sector as well. And that's PTS. Post-traumatic stress. You don't have to be in a combat zone to have it. And I think the speakers you've heard and the speakers you'll hear after me will agree that they have some form of PTS. We'd like to change that up. We'd like to change it to PTG, post-traumatic growth. How do you grow from the experiences you've, ex you've had in your life, whether they've been good or bad? It's our choice. We have a choice of how we react. When you make a choice, People have to live with that choice. Remember the 44 people within your sphere of influence? 
So if you can help one person, you aren't helping just one person, you're helping 45. If one person dies, it affects 44 people, an average of 44 people for the rest of their lives. Life is a brutal teacher. You get the test first and then learn the lesson. I made mistakes. Some people will say, Kristen, this is karma. And I have to live with this. And that's for another time, another story. But what I have opted to do to turn my PTS into PTG, something good, growth, we are all survivors of something. Lost job, broken heart, debt, illness, you name it. You're a survivor. We have a national ice cream day, May 17th. I think the congressman from Vermont, where Ben and Jerry's is headquartered, <laughs> decided to come up with that. We have Heart Awareness Month in February. We have Stroke Awareness Month in May. I'm a stroke survivor. I'm very involved with stroke awareness in the month of May. October is, stroke, is uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. We don't have a Survivor's Day. So I've been working with our community, the city council, the county commissioners and the state of Colorado have proclaimed a Survivor's Day. Perseverance in the face of adversity. And I'm trying to work with the White House because I want it as an executive order. It's a day that we can hold our head up high and hold, pull our shoulders back, say we have survived and how do we help other people? So no matter what the obstacle, we put one foot in front of the other and we march forth and conquer. March 4th is the day for survivors. But it's not just one day. It was last Sunday. It's not just one day. September 20th every year is my March 4th. I put one foot in front of the other, and it may be a baby step, but I go forth. April 21st, every year is March 4th for me. I have chosen that every day in my life will be March 4th. I just have to remember when I write a check, not to be March 4th. <laughs> That has given me and my family hope. So how do we collectively, as a military community, we all family, we've heard speakers today talk about how our family is not necessarily who we are siblings with or who our parents are. It is sometimes those we choose to be around. But our military, our Air Force, is our family. They're our safety net. There are times when I don't want to march forth. I need a piggyback ride. I need to put my arms around someone and I need them to help me. Or two people. You can either go it alone or you can go at it with friends. I really recommend the friend route because it's a lot more fun. How can we help each other? We can't solve each other's problems, but we can be noticers. Do you have a coworker who no longer has a family picture on their desk? Do you have a coworker who is an extrovert, but they've been off for a few days? They aren't that extrovert. They aren't that tigger. Again, you can't solve their problems, but if you notice and you go up to them and give an ear or a hug or a handshake or a smile, it's contagious. It means the world. 
It absolutely means the world. There is a saying that I love, and I just heard it from Chief Boyer of the Air Force Academy. It takes nothing away from a lit candle to light another candle. But what the, it does give is more light. Suicide is a tough subject. It is not tough. But silence does is no good. And my family and I are ready to talk about it. To talk about the hope. Because life is a tough teacher. We get the test first. How do we become the tutor for the lesson? And together we can march forward and come. Presentations today is from someone I'm proud to call a friend. In just the past few years, she stood up to and overcome a trauma that rocked her physically and mentally. Please help me welcome Michelle Morales. Change. It's not always rainbows and butterflies. It hurts. It hurts. And it makes us, forces us into a cocoon where we need to come back out as something else. Today you've heard a lot of resilient stories. And I can tell you, all of you have been too. Mom started four years ago. I was the spouse who did it all. <laughs> and I was driving up the street to pick up the carpool kids. Turned the corner into the high school. And from the corner of my eye, I saw a car speeding out of the parking lot. As I was passing the stop sign, she apparently didn't see me. Because BAM! She smacked, it, smacked into me at 42 miles an hour. I thought that I drove my car to the side of the road and kept it safe. But there's no way I did, because the engine block was gone. I jumped out of the car thinking I was fine, ran to the back of the car to go see if the teenager was fine. She was fine. She was walking around the car. The next thing I know, there are paramedics over me telling me I needed to breathe. You need to breathe, man. You need to breathe. You're having a heart attack. You need to breathe. In my head, I thought that I had calmly drove my car to the side of the road, that I did not get hit by my airbag. What happened is when I saw her, my instinct was, I hit my, I hit the horn, the airbag hit, punched me in the head, hit me to the door, and then I jostled back a little bit. So I had woken up to go check on the girl, and I didn't know. I refused to go to the emergency room. My husband had to force me to the emergency room because there's nothing broken. I'm not bleeding. I'm fine. They finally get me through the emergency room, and lucky enough, I have no internal bleeding. bleeding. I have a broken rib, and I have a lot of bruising. You know, I punched myself in the head. <laughs> so, wow, I'm lucky. We're going home. You, have a, you might have some concussion symptoms, so watch yourself. So I did. Twelve days later, I'm at the bank. I'm on heavy pain meds, so I'm not driving. My daughter's driving. And I go to the teller, and I give her a check, and I said, I'd like to deposit this, please, and give me 100 cash back. The teller looks at me like I have three heads. And my daughter says, it's OK, Mom. It'll be OK. She'd like to put some money in the bank, please. I looked at my daughter like, why are you translating for me? It's okay, Mom, you're not making any sense. What do you mean I'm not making any sense? What I was saying was macaroni cheese spaghetti. I don't even like macaroni, but that's what I was saying. Macaroni cheese spaghetti, macaroni. I was really upset because that is the point when I realized something was seriously wrong in my head. But it was short-lived. By the time I got home, it was gone. I had no sort of memory. Yay! It's a blessing in a curse. We find out that I do have a mild concussion. And they tell me, 
you know, take it easy, stay off the computer, just take care of yourself. So I do. Now, this point of the story now goes to my husband's point of view and my children, because I have no memory of this. I would wake up, my husband would bring me downstairs, he would sit me on the couch, and in my head, I was sending out emails, I was still doing work for my campaign, I was doing everything I normally would have done. He would come home at six, and I would still be sitting, staring at the same spot on the floor. But in my head, I had a full day. What my husband found out later was that I was doing this every time he left me. I would not move, I would not eat, I would not go to the restaurant, I would not do anything. Time meant nothing to me. For the next six months, we were just told, you have a concussion, you never take it easy. So we did. Well, he did because I was planning to vegetate the state. And then I remember telling him, I, I, want, I want more. I, 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 need, I need to do who I am. I, I, I can't sit here anymore. So I had my daughter driving me everywhere, and I was trying to go back to my meetings, and I was trying to go back to being over a month. But I did too much. One day we get home, and you know the macaroni and cheese spaghetti incident that I was so upset about? I couldn't speak at all. Um, it's really hard to think about this because of all the memories that fell out of my head, I remember this one. I was in my head with that voice that tells you you're not good enough. I was alone with it. I was alone with it. And every moment of my day, it said, you lost your voice because you're useless. You don't need to live. No one needs to hear you. No one needs to see you. Just stay in this box. Stay in the dark. And I remember sitting in my living room crying, thinking, why am I alive? Why does God hate me so much? What did I do? Maybe I shouldn't be here. I know it wasn't the voice in my head, because it was much meaner to me. A voice from outside of me said, Get up, you're not dead yet. And I remember thinking, Sir, yes, sir. <laughs> now, who said that? You're not dead yet. No, I'm not. What can I do? What can I do to get me back? And I did what the doctor told me not to do. I got on the computer and uh, started researching some things. And what I found out was, as a military spouse, I can still be seen at the Warrior Recovery Center, at the person. So the doctor sent me to the recovery center, and they would test me in the morning. And every time they tested me, I would test as a normal high school graduate adult, which was fine. But I would come home, and I would blank and start staying at the wall again. My husband's like, Okay, something's wrong. I need to come with you. I need to be your advocate because you're apparently not remembering to tell something to these neuro neurologists. So he brings me back, and this time they test me. And I walk in, and I seem perfectly normal, right? They said, close your eyes. Flat! Right to the ground. If I close my eyes, I fall. They showed me, like, five numbers and said, can you tell us any of these five numbers? And I said, numbers? Tell us the five numbers back. What numbers? They showed me pictures of animals. Right, Michael? They showed me pictures of animals. And I couldn't even identify what a pig was. What's ironic about this, it was about the same time my accident happened. At 2.30, my brain stopped. Now, they do more tests and more tests, and what they find out is Yes, I look like I'm perfectly fine, but I have four areas in my brain that do not work anymore. I have no frontal lobe. My left side of my brain is the back side is gone. I wear glasses because my balance is off because I, I need a cone in my vision to keep me upright. I took it off the way I went back. <laughs> and then the oddest thing is, I don't know what it's called, so if any medical people want to string it out, there's a thing that connects our two brains together. Mine is no longer connected. I am called 
a high-functioning TBI. I'm a lab rat for you, you know. And what's really hilarious about this, and not hilarious really, is when I was in that dark place, when I was alone in the room and the voice in my head kept telling me how useless I was, it was actually a miracle for me. Because if that voice didn't tell me to get up, I'd still be there wondering I would have vegetated. I probably would have killed myself. I'm quite sure I was there. Sorry. But I'm a miracle of science. And the neurologist told me, you know, you have the most beautiful brain. You have the most beautiful brain. Because what happened is, I should have corrects. I should be screaming obscenities. I should be very angry. I don't act like a TBI. But one of the things my husband, very smart man, by the way, um, <laughs> he put everything on my phone. Everything. I drive down Woodman. This happened in 2014. I drive down Woodman. I get lost on a straight road. Everything on my cell phone tells me to wake up, go to the gym. Get, I mean, go to the restroom, make sure you eat. It tells me everything to this day. I look perfectly normal, don't I? My life is programmed in an iPhone. Please don't let that company go out of business. <laughs> it's like, hmm. And even here, I'm sitting here listening to all these stories and everything is coming back into my memory. You see, I have no memories of that incident. Now, who here has seen that movie um, with Drew Barrymore? What is that? 51st days. I am 51st days. I am the perfect wife. I remember nothing from yesterday. <laughs> you looked out. <laughs> so the other thing on really bad days, if I've overdone it, so let's say today, I've been talking, I've been around all of you, and I'm doing great right now, but as soon as I leave this room, I will turn into Dory. Do you know Dory? And I'm literally, oh, shiny, oh, shiny. And that's all I do. I, I, I have to confine myself to good spaces. There's a quote by Maya Angelou, and believe it or not, I remember it. If you don't like your situation, change it. If you can't change your situation, you change your attitude. I, can't, I cannot change my situation. I will always have this to be honest. But I can change my attitude about it. And I did. You see, I'm no longer a campaign manager. I'm not Uber mom anymore. But the thing I have now is I can talk. <laughs> I can talk. <laughs> and so I use it. It's, it's a gift that I've now enhanced because it's what I've got. I stopped dwelling in the past. I, kept, I used to look back trying to figure out why did I lose this? Why, why, why? Forget yesterday. The past doesn't define you anyways. Remember the growth from whatever happens to you and move forward. I have a benefit. It goes away naturally. But live by my example. You know that quote we used to hear when we were growing up? Right? Just let it go, let it go. You know that kind of thing. Let it go. Let the past go. Take the lessons from that growth and move forward and don't look back. Become the best person you can possibly be as you are now. In the center of the table, I put rubber bands because everybody here is resilient. And what I thought about is maybe if you, if you need it, put the rubber band on your wrist. And the next time you start thinking, I'm being stretched way too far, too far, I can't do it, I can't do it, Remember, you can. And even if you stretch very, very far, you will come back. You may not be the perfect circle, but you're back. Even if you pull to your breaking point, tie the ends together, be you, the new you. So, no, life is not rainbows and butterflies. It's pretty harsh. But you can live for it. It'll force you to look at who you truly are and who you really want to become. My accident, my loss of memory has become the biggest asset of my life. 
and it can be your biggest, biggest asset also, like all these people share. And it's an honor to share the same with all of you. Remember, snap back. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Michelle, for those stories that really kind of summarize everything we've heard today. And I think we've all heard stories that in some way or another connect to all of us, or if not you, probably some of you know. Thank you to all the speakers today. It takes a lot of courage and a lot of strength to share these stories, but it's vital for everyone to learn and to open this dialogue in this military community. Please, another round of applause for our speakers.